The two mRNA COVID vaccines were sequenced, developed, and approved for widespread use in the U.S. in record time. But they were actually decades in the making. Almost everybody working on COVID vaccines comes from the HIV world. The clinical trialists, the companies. Moderna had been working on an mRNA-based HIV vaccine before SARS-CoV-2 was even known to exist. mRNA technology meant wonders for developing COVID vaccines, but its effectiveness in the fight against HIV is still unclear. We knew the human immune system could get rid of COVID. That's not seen with HIV. Essentially, no one self-cures HIV. mRNA is a very promising new technology. HIV is still an incredibly formidable foe. A crucial component to all vaccine research and development is government funding. Operation Warp Speed allocated about $10 billion in a matter of months for private companies to use toward developing a vaccine as well as treatments for COVID-19. By contrast, between 2000 and 2020, the U.S. government contributed about $12 billion toward HIV vaccine research and development. Just about every vaccine that we get today was developed by some private company, even though the actual research and development may have been a shared enterprise. We have really at the moment very little corporate interest in HIV. The reason at that moment it is, is that it's very risky. But the success of the COVID vaccines show the risk could pay off. If we leave exclusive control of manufacturing and pricing and distribution of life-saving medical technologies to for-profit companies, then the result is inequitable access. We clearly see in HIV that this remains a disease of people who are uh, marginalized and stigmatized and in some countries criminalized. So what does the success of the COVID mRNA vaccines mean for HIV? And who would profit from an HIV vaccine? If you asked many AIDS activists of the 1980s about the race toward a cure for HIV, they would probably describe it as more of a crawl. The Center for Disease Control documented the first case of what would later be identified as AIDS in 1981. President Ronald Reagan didn't make his first public speech about the AIDS crisis until May 1987, six years after the first case was reported. Only medical science can ever truly defeat AIDS. Activists in the 80s and early 90s protested aggressively, staging die-ins to urge the government, which included Dr. Anthony Fauci, who was appointed director of National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases in 1984, to move faster to develop treatments and eventually find a cure. Researchers and historians do place a lot of credit to activists, especially in fomenting anti-HIV drug development, they also had a role to play in stimulating research in other forms of HIV prevention, one of which is the development of vaccines. In the past three decades, there have been many more resources devoted to HIV research from both the public and private sectors. The U.S. government is an incredibly valuable partner in biomedical and pharmaceutical R&D. The U.S. government has contributed more money toward developing an HIV vaccine than any other revenue source, including the commercial sector. In 2020, the U.S. government contributed nearly $650 million to HIV vaccine research. Philanthropic donations were the second leading contributor, with a total of about $94 million contributed that year. $92 million of it was from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The total commercial investment was $7 million in 2020, though that number may be too low due to underreporting. Overall, the public sector, including from governments other than the U.S., made up 87% of investments into HIV vaccine research and development in 2020. These funding sources frequently end up going to private companies to conduct the research and development of a vaccine. Without companies, you can't actually get these vaccines to market. In 2015, Merck and Moderna launched a partnership to develop vaccines and immunity therapies for HIV based on Moderna's mRNA technology. Moderna then won a $20 million grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to go toward developing an mRNA vaccine for HIV. The investment into HIV research paved the way for huge advancements in vaccine development. People were really looking to this mRNA technology as a, a new way to rapidly produce vaccines for a lot of different infections. A vaccine is made up of two critical things. There's a vector, or what I often think of as kind of the vehicle or the car that's delivering something, and the passenger, which is the kind of information 
we're trying to deliver to the cells to protect you from getting infected. And we know in COVID that mRNA is an incredibly great vehicle or platform or vector to deliver that information. Traditional immunization methods involve injecting a weakened form of a virus into the body. This material is frequently referred to as an antigen. This triggers the immune system to create antibodies, which protect a person in the event a live virus gets into their system. An mRNA vaccine doesn't use the virus itself. It instead creates a blueprint to instruct the body on how to fight the virus. The antigen for COVID-19 is called the spike protein. HIV has what scientists call the envelope protein. Early on, the thought was that if we could produce antibodies to this envelope protein, which is akin to the spike protein more or less on the coronavirus, that could hopefully prevent people from acquiring HIV. But in clinical trials, the antibodies that were produced against HIV were not effective. Johnson & Johnson announced in late August 2021 that its trial for an HIV vaccine failed to offer enough protection to keep the study going. The study was a public-private partnership between J&J, the NIH, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the HIV Vaccine Trials Network. HIV mutates very rapidly, uh, although we have learned already that the virus that causes COVID mutates, and then if we have a long enough epidemic, we'll get lots of different variants. HIV is just far more unstable, and it has to do with the way in which the virus makes copies of itself it just makes bad copies in the sense that it doesn't make perfect duplicates. And every one of those copies is another mutation. The traditional thinking around vaccines is to mimic the body's natural immune response to a virus. The problem with HIV is the body's natural immune response isn't strong enough to fight the virus. This means a vaccine has to come at the problem in a different way. We knew the human immune system could get rid of COVID. That's not seen with HIV. Essentially, no one self-cures HIV. There have been many attempts to create a vaccine for HIV. In one of the more notable studies conducted in Thailand between 2003 and 2009, researchers combined two different vaccine approaches to see if they can produce neutralizing antibodies, which are antibodies that could be strong enough to block HIV from infecting the cells. The problem is, is that all prior HIV vaccine regimens have not been able to produce these neutralizing antibodies. If we can get vaccine antigens designed in such a way that then we can teach the immune system to produce these neutralizing antibodies. And that's where the mRNA technology comes in is because we suspect that this will be a very iterative process, meaning that we'll have to try something and go back and change it. Or you may start with one antigen and then you tweak it slightly and then you tweak it slightly again uh, with serial vaccinations over time to produce those really holy grail neutralizing antibodies. The fact that on its face, the vaccine models for HIV were failures disguises the fact that they were great successes in developing the tools, the know-how and the understanding in order to move forward with a number of other vaccines that were successfully developed the partnerships between the government and private companies are significant for other reasons. It can leave in limbo who controls various patents of a vaccine, and that means who makes the money off of sales. We can see this issue playing out now between Moderna and the NIH regarding a key patent over Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine. Moderna and the NIH are currently locked in a patent fight over credit in developing the antigen for the vaccine. The NIH says several of its scientists deserve to be listed as co-inventors of the genetic sequence, while Moderna maintains its scientists are solely responsible for its creation. I think part of NIH's thinking here is that it wants its scientists to get credit for creating this medical breakthrough. It doesn't want this vaccine to be known as the Moderna vaccine. It wants it to be known as the NIH Moderna vaccine, which is indeed, by the way, how NIH referred to the vaccine in early press releases, if you go back to last year. Part of, I think, the NIH's claim here is about credit, but an equally, maybe more important part is about control. Moderna projects that its COVID vaccine could draw up to $18 billion in sales in 2021 and up to an estimated $22 billion in sales in 2022. As of November 2021, the case between Moderna and the government is ongoing. If the government is included on this patent, it could have a say in how the vaccine is licensed. Given the just staggering costs of drugs and healthcare more broadly in the United States, and given how successful the United States government has been in partnering with industry, 
Um, I think the U.S. government has enormous expertise and more leverage, more power um, than it realizes, than we realize. We need a concerted public-private partnership that really is dedicated to HIV vaccines. And we need the citizens of the world, as well as the scientific community and the commercial technology community to work on this. And they need to be compensated for their time and efforts. I think what's remarkably frustrating is that agreements were made with tens of billions of U.S. taxpayer dollars to fund the development, to fund the clinical trials to get it authorized and not ensure that there would be allowance for pool patents, to share those patents, to share that technology. I don't think it means that we are needing to deny companies access to resources um, from the federal government to partner. I certainly don't think it means we don't want companies involved. It can't mean that because then we won't have any innovation. And it can't mean that companies can't make money. But we have to think about what is fair and what is right and what is just and what gets us global health impact. Funding has implications beyond money. Licensing rights can change who ultimately gets access to a vaccine. The vaccines for COVID are covered under numerous patents. In fact, it would be better to describe that as a web of patents, since one patent per a company licenses patents from another, which in turn then develops its own patents. And some of these patents are held by the U.S. government, for example. Others are held by private academic institutions. And there may be a trend in the future to release the constraints on this intellectual property so that vaccines against COVID will be able to be produced uh, in other countries that may have the manufacturing facilities and the know-how, but really are barred from doing it. Despite the tremendous investment into the COVID vaccine's development, the distribution has not been equal across different countries, with only about 1% of people in low-income countries receiving at least one dose. I think we've learned something really important that not only do you have to do great science, but you have to plan for success much more robustly and much more equitably before you even get the clinical trial results. I would hope that the lesson we have learned when you're debating an emergency use authorization or an actual approval from a regulatory agency, you need to have a global manufacturing plan in advance. And to their credit, we have vaccines that got authorized very quickly, and those of us in America got access to it. But clearly, there was not the vision and the foresight to, to think about global manufacturing. I would hate to see the inequities that we now see with access to COVID vaccines, or the inequities that we've seen over the last decades in access to HIV treatment medications and HIV prevention medications repeat themselves with an HIV vaccine. And that's something I'm really concerned about. It's obviously a pressing human health need. It has been for decades. It's been really frustrating, but at the same time, I think there's huge promise in mRNA and other new platforms, viral vector vaccines too. Um, so I'm cautiously optimistic that we will see a working HIV vaccine, let's say in the next decade.